two years on from the New York Times article kind of announcing the intellectual dark web, it's right in the center of the, of the sort of the culture war, the national conversation. Those things are always in flux and it's probably the most kind of fast moving part of the culture. And is, is the IDW still a going concern? Is it still alive? Is it dead? Or where do you see it? I mean, do you find my devotion to this ancient religion quaint? Uh, you know, I would ask you, what, I think the Jedi are dead, right? Because their temple was destroyed. Maybe just a few stragglers and remnants. Let people believe whatever they want to believe. I mean, that doesn't really matter. Maybe it's dead. Maybe it's in hibernation. Maybe, in fact, it actually got its message out and all sorts of people are currently carrying the message who aren't the names that you know because it was too easy to pretend that Jordan Peterson wanted enforced monogamy, that Sam Harris was an Islamophobe, that Joe Rogan was some sort of a meathead right winger. Maybe the idea was that uh, Ben Shapiro was a closet Nazi. Who knows? It's too easy to take out individuals. What I would say is, you know, wherever there's someone in danger of losing their job for making an observation, wherever there's somebody uh, who's trying to use their own eyes to observe gender differences that someone else is claiming are both there and not there at the same time, wherever you have some situation where you need to keep a facility open that can adjudicate between fact and fantasy and people don't want to be pushed into some sort of utopian vision that isn't theirs, Maybe there's a little piece of IDW there. I don't know. But the key issue isn't, is it alive or dead? It's what is it? And that's always been the animating question. And I would like to think that just the way, um, you know, let's say the weavers existed during the McCarthy era uh, in order to let people know that something hadn't died completely. I think we did a pretty good job of keeping a flame uh, lit while the winds were blowing at their strongest. I'd like to think that at some level enough people are now carrying embers from that flame that I'm a lot less worried about this going out completely. But if you look at the run of Andrew Yang, which was much better than anyone thought could possibly, he did much better than anyone thought he could possibly do, given the amount of institutional resistance to even reporting his successes. You'd have to say that this has been a pretty powerful movement. I would say he would be the quintessential sort of IDW candidate. I haven't said that before, but I think it's f fair to say now. It wasn't even necessary that I supported UBI or everything that he wanted to do or say. But he was somebody who was coming out of the same energy. And I think it's too early to say what the thing actually is and will be. And we're looking forward to getting Jordan Peterson back and maybe having some future collisions on some of these shows. And you had a really interesting conversation with Sam Harris at a live town hall event that he gave. You named a problem that I that I knew I had, but I hadn't been thinking about it. I mean, I, 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 you, you that was that was very useful to hear, and it's, uh, now I'm worried. So, so well, um, yeah. So I think it, it is essentially uh, a year and a day since the IDW article appeared in the New York Times, which had its own weird effect on the world. And I think what we did is, is that we created a, uh, an immune reaction where the people who had jobs as professional commentators through institutions um, realized that there was some sort of a problem uh, relative to their business model. And they started attacking us with very low quality attacks. Like, you know, when, you, when you're calling Ben Shapiro the alt-right, something has gone wrong. Uh, it's pretty obvious. I don't know whether the kippah doesn't yes. have the effect on, on them that it does on me. I think that we are, are now finding ourselves uh, in a world in which it's very hard to even understand what's being said to us. And I'm just, I don't think it's you. I'm getting worse and worse and worse as the, the lousy, terrible critiques that are motivated by the political economy of a failing business model rather than intellectual charity and fairness and, and a sense of equanimity and comedy, um, as those attacks pile up, uh, I find that um, I'm just, I'm, it's like playing against a bad tennis player and, and my tennis game has just gone to hell. Right. So I, I, yeah, yeah. have you had this experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I didn't, I, I, again, I knew I was, 
I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know I was the problem. You talked about that the, from your perspective, the intellectual dark web had created a kind of immune reaction from the mainstream media, and mm -hmm. um, that the critiques had been so poor that you felt that they were actually making you worse, like a kind of uh, poor tennis player and your games getting worse. Oh, absolutely. Worse. Um, could you could you expand on that? Sure. I mean, the the big lazy critique is that you just use the word alt right. So there's a series of kill shots that the commentariat attempts to use from wherever their position at the Atlantic or Harper's or the New York Times or the Washington Post, wherever they happen to be resident. And you see this uh, very often on Twitter. And the words are alt-right, thirsty, grifter, anybody who's attempting to insert themselves into a conversation which is supposed to be gated. Um, is immediately sort of pushed towards expulsion. And all of these words are one phrase arguments. If you say that someone is a Nazi, then obviously that person shouldn't be listened to. But then when you have to say that Ben Shapiro, an Orthodox Jew, is a Nazi, you do have your work cut out for you. And when you have to say that um, Brett Weinstein is a racist who got effectively um, ejected from the University of Pennsylvania for standing up for black women, I mean, at some point you've gone completely insane. And that's where this argument really deranged, is that there have been so many bad, lazy critiques by people who are trying to keep the commentary at a guild and don't want anyone coming in from the digital layer. Um, I, I think that that's sort of the origin of why the conversation stalls out is that they don't want to actually critique the ideas. They don't want to have a sit down and, and they attempt to use the penchant for free speech as, a, as an additional kill shot. So the idea is if they call you, uh, you know, a mean white man or something like that, and then you say, I'm not going to listen to this. And they say, oh, I thought, what about my free speech? Okay, well, that's your argument. That's the level at which the schoolyard taunt, uh, you know, it's like I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off me, uh, bounces off the uh, me and sticks to you. That kind of retort, or no means yes, yes means no, do you want me to hit you? And so, okay, no, then you get hit. Yes, then you get hit. I get it. So I went to third grade. I, I failed third grade schoolyard stuff too. That's the level at which the commentary in general attacks the ideas of others. Are there any critiques that you think were, have been valuable or been useful? Very few. There have been a few, but very few. Well, it, it's really been pretty slim pickings. David Pakman, at his best, um, I think has been a pretty astute and fair observer on the harder, I don't even want to call it harder left. I mean, he's sort of, sort of weirdly between the woke and the IDW. Um, you know, then there are people who are very smart. Like, for example, I think of Sam Cedar as being very informed on policy terms. Like, he's actually following a particular bill or, you know, probably knows the names of staffers on the Hill, that kind of granular detail. Uh, the problem with him is that he's got a strong trolling game and kind of a comedic ridicule game that is a turnoff to, I mean, it's okay for, as wit, but it's not okay as a main course. And um, so I think that you could pick through the, uh, the Sam Cedar stuff and find reasonable stuff, but I wouldn't recommend it because of the reliance on ridicule. Also in the conversation with Sam Harris, you talked about that a lot of the criticisms of the intellectual, the members of the intellectual dark web were made by people in the legacy media who had kind of inherited their, their seats. What are my responsibilities? We've never worked this out. We've never had a really good conversation about the fact that the Sam Harris platform and the Sam Harris human are very different than, than let's say, the Michelle Goldberg human on the New York Times platform. And a lot of these t traditional commentators have lower engagement as individuals. And if you think about the fusion between the chair and the human, the chair has a lot of the power. Like anytime the New York Times says that person there is worth listening to, 
that person, whether they have interesting ideas or not, or good or bad ideas, becomes super important because they inherit power from the chair. So now when that sort of set of responsibilities comes through to me, like, I don't have a book, I don't have a show, I got mm -hmm. nothing. I just, I, I, my, my wife tells me, you know, I'm tired of your theories, go to Twitter and, and, and try it out with, you, with your audience. Mm -hmm. You know, like, that's my platform. And, and then I hear things like, Eric, you have a platform. You have a tremendous responsibility. It's like, what platform? I just I signed up for Twitter. And that, that kind of weird new problem is super interesting because I've never really had to think about this. I built the entire thing completely 100% by myself, uh, you know, while I'm, like, doing the dishes and I'll, I'll type something and then suddenly, you know, I've got 1,000 people who are angry at me or, or really interested in something I have to say. We haven't had the discussion about the ethics of what if you succeed at what it is that you're doing on social media. We, and we're inheriting these questions from people who inherited their platforms. And we didn't inherit our platforms. We built our platforms. So we've never actually had a really good ethics discussion um, also about dining a la carte. There are very few people who are so horrible that they've never said anything remotely interesting or reasonable. I mean, I challenge you. Jeffrey Dahmer or, you know, uh, Ted Bundy probably said reasonable things, you know, pass, pass the sugar, please. You know, not every instance uh, uh, of an utterance from a bad person, a horrible person, is horrible or without content. And so a lot of the criticisms were a sort of set of journalistic ethics that you weren't, that you thought were, were not appropriate for someone who built their platforms by hand. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, can you talk more about that? Well, the idea is if, sudden, if, if you've been... Uh, given a position at, let's say, uh, the Atlantic uh, or the New York Times, your power is a fusion between the chair in which you sit and yourself. The chair has most of that power. If, were you to leave that chair, would anyone even be listening to you? Or how small would your audience be? So when you have that sort of a situation, you, you, you can talk about whether or not somebody is abusing the power of the chair that they have inherited even the concept of platforming somebody. I mean, this was not a verb uh, that I was <laughs> aware of until very recently. I'm sure we could do a Google Ngram search and find out that it's relatively recent in origin. Now, when somebody says, well, you have a platform, you have a responsibility, I think, wait, what? I, I have a YouTube channel. Like, you have a YouTube account, I have a YouTube account. Like, well, your YouTube account is over 100,000 subscribers. Yes, but that's because people started subscribing to my channel. It's not that, you know, I, I got a job at Eric Weinstein YouTube channel, and then I had the responsibility of being the custodian of this channel. It's like, screw off. What the hell are you talking about? You're revealing, in essence, um, that you and I are in different circumstances. Now, it's not to say I don't have any responsibilities. Far from it. But to talk about, well, you have such a large platform, what are you going to do with, like PewDiePie? Well, who the hell is PewDiePie? I mean, PewDiePie is a guy with a channel. And whatever he did, uh, it built an incredible followership. Now, does he have responsibilities? Yes, but really as an individual, he has responsibilities. And I, I do agree that, you know, it's a little bit daunting that he's got this many people listening to him. But on the other hand, it's very, very different than the idea of this has been passed to you and you must pass it to the next person and that, that this vehicle effectively came with most of the interest. We chose you and we gifted you this power. So now with great power comes great responsibility. That's very different than somebody who built something uh, with their own sweat and people flock to it. That's the market saying, okay, well, I'm going to forego all the pleasures of listening to the synchronized legacy stuff, and I'm going to actually dine a la carte off the menu. Because this is really interesting to me, because I come from, I worked in the newsroom at Channel 4 News for, for 10 years, I've worked at the BBC, I've like internalized a lot of those kind of mainstream media values, and I'm sort of seeing how they apply to Rebel Wisdom, which has been going for about two years. And at their best, I would say that some of the values are good faith engagement. It's that you should, or if you have any allegations or any kind of claims to put about someone, you should put them to the person first and get a response, which seems like a good, a good rule of thumb. That you will give space for for, for people to respond. Um, you will, I mean, fact checking should be integral to journalism. 
we can kind of talk about that the mainstream media is not actually doing a lot of the things that it should have been or doing, doing them very selectively and saying we're going to fact check the hell out of this and we're going to give this other thing a free pass i yeah. think this is where the gonzo critique of journalism comes in it's like would you stop pretending to be god with a god's eye view of the universe and don't talk about yourself as the queen in the first person plural for god's sakes you know, you have a perspective, you have biases, you have friendships. I'd rather that you sort of tell me why well, I happen to be friends with the subject, so I'm not going to necessarily throw that person under the bus. And it's very funny when you see some of these people say, well, you know, you gave so-and-so a free pass. You're like, you mean my friend? I gave a free pass? The person who comes over to dinner, you expect me to somehow have an obligation to you to air all of my misgivings about that person for your viewing pleasure because of my responsibility to the public. Where did you come up with this, you dear sweet child? Mm. Um, you know, I expect to be able to tell people so-and-so is a friend of mine or, I, you know, for example, my relationship with Nassim Taleb. I love Nassim. Now, does Nassim piss me off? Does he, does he frighten me? Do I think he's out of control when he beats up on other people that I know and like? I have real trouble with what he's doing. But do you expect me to stab him in the back for your pleasure because of my commitment to some journalistic code of ethics that no journalist is following when I'm not a journalist? I mean, very funny that you've developed all of these strong feelings and beliefs and entitlements. But it is very interesting. I think I completely agree with the rise of the alternative media has shown up that the mainstream media has a perspective, like this kind of God's eye view affectation is shown more and more as an affectation, like it's very obvious. Well, look at them on Twitter. Yeah. They're the most biased, completely activist people you could imagine, pretending that, you know, I, whenever I get one of these people, I always say, can we go over to the journalistic code of ethics and see which points, because you're, you're violating 3A paragraph 2. But, but I would say that you've also hinted at what some of the other failure conditions of the new sense-making platforms are, and they're very human failings. They're, they're kind of potentially audience capture, they are friendships and human human contact or human relationships between some of the some of the people involved can also start to become warping of, of truth. It could be, but one of the things that we like to do, I think, is to say, well, so and so is my friend. I have a great deal of private information. Like, you know, I don't think it's a secret that I don't like Ben Shapiro's Red Meat Act. And I call it the Red Meat Act. That's about as far as I want to go. I don't want to undermine Ben's ability to earn a living or produce an entertaining news analysis product. Mm -hmm. And I've taken him to task in public. Um, mm -hmm. But in private, when I call him up, he's about the most responsive, reasonable, tolerant, kind person in my one-on-one. -on -one. Now, that is a little uncomfortable because I don't see the same person on the phone as the sort of firebrand uh, who sits behind the desk. Are those two people connected? They're absolutely connected. Ben and I don't share the same perspectives on the phone, but we probably share 90, 95% of the analysis. And then there's like a very <laughs> extreme turn at the end. Um, but I think that my people are much more, anybody listening to me is much better informed about the fact that this dichotomy between public Ben and private Ben even exists. So I would claim that you're actually getting better information from me than you are somebody saying, I would never talk to a person like Ben Shapiro because once in 2009 he said the following thing. Yeah, and just talking about kind of the evolution of, of journalistic ethics within the alternative media, one Please. of the things that I was looking at and was re really interested by was Joe Rogan's interview with Jack Dorsey, where he got this huge pushback from his audience and then in the, in, I think the, the podcast afterwards, so just to recap for people, so Jack kind of basically stonewalled, didn't give particularly kind of complete answers, and Joe maybe didn't, didn't know enough to kind of push back, and kind of it was, a, as Joe said, it was a kind of crappy interview. But in the, next, in the next interview, I think with Sam Harris, he went through that interview and was kind of like, I've got this responsibility that I never asked for, I never knew that I had, I just like talking to people, and suddenly my audience has given me all of this crap for not asking uh, Jack Dorsey to defend sort of Twitter's banning and the way that Twitter censors people on their platform and kind of his audience really felt like he'd let them down. And what I really respected about Joe was that you saw him go through this process of, I never asked for this responsibility, but now I realize that I have it and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do better. He got Tim Pool on for one of the future shows to, to have Jack Dorsey on again. But then Jack Dorsey came on with a- with uh, a lawyer. 
with the lawyer. Sure, but what, I, what I'm saying is that I, what I feel I'm seeing with Joe Rogan is this evolution in real time of this is actually, and, and actually taking on some of the responsibilities that he never really asked for. Do you, do you see it the same way? Not exactly. I mean, I think, you know, at some point, um, I think I got a call from Joe or a text message I couldn't remember. Um, and I don't want to reveal the private contents, but more or less, he's kind of like, what did I just do? I just said something about Bernie and suddenly the Bernie Sanders campaign is running, uh, you know, some sort of ad that says I've endorsed him. I was like, well, sort of you did in accordance with the new rules of the world. I think one of the things that a lot of us are doing is trying to break these expectations about, do you endorse? Do you condemn? Do you condone? You know, just like, would you shut up? Uh, I, I'm a human being. I talk to people. I don't check all of their backgrounds all the time. I don't know if they've had a tweet, you know, in 2011 that, you know, looks terrible. And then I start to learn the context. And now I find the whole history. It's like, you can't move through the world um, if you're saddled with all this. So is it great that Joe is thinking a little bit more about the responsibilities of being effectively the largest show out there? Yeah, I think to an extent. And if he overthinks it, it's going to be terrible because then you're not going to have an authentic person. You're going to have the same mm -hmm. thing creeping in to, um, to Joe's thought process and it'll be self-censorious. So I think we should take on some amount of ethics and we should also give ourselves a budget for ethical failings, for failures of reason, for failures of fairness. And do I think the institutions should have much lower budgets? Yeah, they're, they're institutions. They're funded. They're long-term things that were not usually built by any of the people who are in them. Mm. So I believe the institutional responsibilities are far too low, and the game is to foist personal responsibility onto the individuals who are outside of the Citadel. Um, so I'm excited about the fact that Joe wants to take on responsibility because I think he's a good guy who wants to do well by the world. Uh, do I believe that he has the same responsibilities as the New York Times for fact checking for, you know, he says things like I voted for Gary Johnson because he came on my show or I've met with people and I really like Tulsi Yang and Sanders because they're not corporate people and I'm not a corporate guy, I'm a comedian. But that is the level at which you're getting the analysis. He's speaking as a human being, as human beings speak. He's not speaking the way uh, somebody from a management consulting firm or a PR agency would, would coach you to speak. And I think that's very important. One thing that I like to talk about is the idea of good faith and bad faith. Please. Because one of the one of the things that I see a lot in the in the new sort of alternative media is some kind of gatekeeping based on who's good faith and who's bad faith. Now, it's sort of, it's, it's a paradox in a way because you can have sort of, you can decide, okay, this person's bad faith. It seems to be a subjective judgment that is always kind of laid on someone else. Like I can't imagine a situation where you say, I'm not gonna to talk to you because you're bad faith. And then a few months later, they say, come back and they're like, you were right actually, yeah, back then I was in bad faith and now I'm in good faith. Like no one, like what, what does it actually mean to say that someone is in good faith? I don't think that that's quite true, David. No? No, I think some people self-identify, for example, as trolls. Mm. Like you'll meet somebody and say, yeah, my troll game is strong. Yeah. Like I just enjoy dunking on people on the internet. Like that's, that I'm using the word as they would use the word. And I'm making fun of it. I think that, you know, if, if I think about what Sam Cedar's perspective was on Dave Rubin, it was Dave Rubin's a dangerous guy and I wish to neutralize the danger through ridicule. Right. So I think people will own that in many circumstances and they'll say, I'm employing a tool for amusement, for social good. And, you know, when it comes to like a good faith, bad faith, I had just got into a really unpleasant interchange with Yasmin Mohammed about hijabs. And she thought I was saying one thing, which I wasn't saying. And so she was reacting to that thing that she thought I was saying. And I had the sense of, well, these are really unpleasant arguments you're making back to me. You're treating me like a fool and you're treating me as somebody with no experience who has no idea what they're talking about, which I didn't think was true. And so the question was, do I think I'm dealing with somebody of good faith and I should place a call? Or do I think I'm dealing with somebody who's into a gotcha game who simply wants to put a trophy head on her wall? 
And I'd had some interaction with it before, and I thought very highly of her. So I just said, I bet good faith. Doesn't seem like good faith at the moment, but let's stick it out. Let's see what happens. Sure enough, it takes about 20 minutes to sort out. Oh, that's what you're saying? Oh, that's what you're saying? You cooled her. Yeah. yeah. We called each other. I forget who, who placed the, the final call that connected. But the key point is, I wasn't out to get her. I wasn't out to destroy what she was trying to say. I would have happily signed on for every percentage of what she was saying that I would agree with. And as a result, um, I didn't think that scoring a point on the person was a part of either person's agenda. I, th I think actually you can generally ascertain not whether somebody is a good faith person or a bad faith person, but whether that person is behaving in good faith or bad faith towards you. Like, for example, I've seen Michael Malice say a lot of very intelligent things, very thoughtful things. And I've also seen him just be a dick. And so when he encountered me the other day on Twitter, I was like, I wonder which Michael Malice I'm going to get. And he was just sort of being a dick. And I was thinking like, is this really the modality you want to choose with me? He's like, yeah, let's double down. It's like, okay, got it. That's unfortunate because I'd seen him make some very insightful comments. I guess my point is about good faith, bad faith is mm -hmm. that I've seen it used. Like there's a lot of conversations that are, that, it's almost, I've almost seen it used in a way as kind of on the, on the center as a way of sort of not engaging with certain people, rightly or wrongly. It's often given as a reason for not engaging with certain people that almost seems like an inverse of the no platforming tactics on, on the left. Well, I've been through this with you. It's very important to exclude people from conversation. But how do you know that, how do you know that those decisions are being made? How, how can you tell the difference? Right. How, how can you uh, know that it's a good faith decision of bad faith or a good, good faith declaration of good faith or bad well, but faith? But that's just the problem. It's an issue of skill. Mm. You see? Discernment, maybe. Or... Well, it's, this is the dirty secret that nobody really wants to discuss, that whether or not a society thrives or dies often can't be written into the rules in a precise way because everyone will read the rules and attempt to game them. Oh, but it says here in paragraph 7, that if I do this, that, and the other thing, you can't say anything. So, nya, nya, nya. okay, well, that's great. So you figured out a way around the rules. You've arbitraged uh, the letter against the spirit. Now, in the case of um, excluding people from conversations, the key question that I usually have is, is this person attempting to be constructive or not? Are they interested in the underlying points or are they interested in victories, wins, and losses? I think that a lot of people inside of what you would call the IDW, um, some of them are interested sometimes in wins and losses. And, you know, I've been interested in wins and losses. It's not a huge part of what I want to be doing. Um, and in general, does somebody give you the chance? You know, there are rules for fighting. You smack somebody to the curb hard and it's a decisive victory and you think well of your opponent, you offer that person a hand up and then you say, wow, I thought you really had me. If you don't do that, you're kind of a dick. And I think it's really important to understand that in fighting, if your goal is to just hang other people's heads on your trophy wall, I would call that not good faith. Now, would I engage in that if I thought somebody was a real danger and they were just a terrible faith actor? Maybe. But I, I think that a lot of us take a lot of pains to not back people into corners unnecessarily, to not use gotcha techniques, to not attempt to humiliate people, to not come in guns blazing. And there are all sorts of devices that cue you off that somebody shouldn't be taken seriously, even if they're making a good point. It's like, you know, if there's too much uh, internet speak in what they're doing, too much ha-ha, like very often if I see a lot of attempts at ridicule, I just don't even talk to the person, not because ridicule didn't previously have a place, but because there's something about the internet where the premium on ridicule is absolutely uh, metastatic with respect to what its effect on conversation. There's almost no recovery from talking to somebody whose principal modality is ridicule. Mm. And you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned Sam Cedar in this context. Mm. Um, and you talked about him at length with Sam Harris in one of your recent podcasts. Yeah. 
my... Because, I mean, it's a sadness. Yeah. Because I, I think Sam Cedar has a lot to offer, as does Michael Malice. That's somebody on the left, somebody on the right. Mm. And they both spend sort of a lot of time just trying to hurt people. I, I feel personally uncomfortable watching that, uh, talking about him quite at length, yeah. and not engaging... Like, if, 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 if that was me being talked about by someone else, I'd feel like, hang on, why are you not, saying, why are you not having a conversation with me? Why am I not, oh, why are we not having this conversation? Because we don't agree on what the rules are, David. I mean, if you say, you know that moment when uh, Mike Tyson bit off somebody's ear? That was awesome. Because it's combat. My feeling is, okay, I get it. So you have an idea of greater combat. You probably think that a finger in the eye is hilarious. And my feeling is those aren't the rules of boxing that I'm interested in. So it's not that I can't see that you have skill as a boxer. It's that you have an idea that war is war and only, you know, never give a, a sucker an even break. And so if those are your rules, you, you know why nobody wants to step in the ring with you because you bite people's ears off. Mm. Would you, do you not think you could in, engage him and call out those tactics? I called him up. We had a perfectly reasonable conversation. I, I understood his perspective. I think he understood mine. And I think his perspective was that somebody like Dave Rubin, in his opinion, was such a dangerous person that it was important to stop him more or less by any means necessary within the rules of internet etiquette. And so, you know, just having an army of people constantly say, debate Sam Cedar, you coward, you know, like that phrase over and over again, it was just, that's his style of attack. And, you know, I look at that and I say, well, that's not speech that I'm interested in. That's not, why, why would anyone <laughs> voluntarily deal with it? Nobody would. Mm. Not if you're smart, not if you have a life. I guess it depends whether you feel that that might move on the conversation if you were able to expose it. Maybe it was, but the, the bigger issue is this sort of kind of just nasty thing that the, the internet devolves into at the drop of a hat. Mm. It's like... I have to push myself not to become that person. I don't want to be a troll. I don't want to get into gotcha battles. I don't want to score the clever little epithet. You know, I mean, sometimes, but it's like you're talking about a really exotic spice being used as if it's the substrate of a meal. It's not the main course. If ridicule is the main course, you're doing it wrong. And the other, my other sort of frame of the intellectual dark web at the beginning, or my hope for it, was this sense of could this be like public intellectuals coming together for sort of very high profile events and especially with for example take sam harris and jordan peterson their sort of very uh, famous uh, discussions that they had could that this sense of a potential synthesis yeah this sense of um and i think it's brett's brett's line that all true narratives must reconcile i think he talks about that and then this sense of, for example... What's sort of a unity of knowledge point? Yeah, so just to give an example, something like Brett's evolutionary biology frame and Jordan's Jungian psychology frame. Like for me, that seems, they seem to overlap because Jungian psychology says we have this sort of dark side, we have kind of the killer within us, and it's like, well, of course we do because we, we're the product of an unbroken evolutionary chain. Of course we've got the ability to kill. And so you're describing use. reality in different coordinate systems. Exactly. There has to be a change of coordinates. Yeah, and my hope, I guess, with the first uh, emergence of the intellectual dark was, was that we might get a sense of this sort of synthesis developing. Yeah. I, I don't think I've, I've seen that over the last couple of years. Was that Sorry, a with whom? But with whom? Um, in other words, if you asked me... Yeah. I would say that Sam Harris has begun to understand a little bit of the religious critique that says religion may not be literally true, but it may be incredibly important to functioning, and maybe reason isn't the only thing that globalizes. And Sam has honed his point a little bit more to say, I'm not saying religion has nothing to offer. Uh, if you check carefully throughout time, what I've been saying is, is that I think reason always has a better claim on uh, what you might call transcendence or spirituality. And I think that to some extent, the new atheist conversation has kind of moved towards one in which fitness in an evolutionary sense uh, and truth are seen as competing uh, goals at some point that they may walk a great deal of the path together, but at some point fitness and truth may diverge. Um, I think at our best, there has been 
a lot of synthesis so that new atheism may have moved on. I would like to think that Richard Dawkins encountering Brett was uh, a more meaningful conversation where there was a recognition that maybe things don't begin and end with a random mutation or the selfish gene. Um, so I think that actually it has been happening. But if the question is, what about a super brand in which you've got seven to 10 people who everybody knows have conflicting points of view progressively coming together? I mean, I was there, for example, you know, James Damore and Jordan Peterson met in my kitchen. Uh, I was the organizer of the dinner where Ben Shapiro and Sam Harris first encountered each other in the flesh. Uh, you know, Brett was there when Jordan Peterson met Sam Harris for the first time. I think that there's been a lot of movement. Um, now, if you ask me, it's very hard for this thing to have moved on, given the fact that there was no institutional support. There was just this constant kind of tax from bad attacks, um, you know, with like, constantly defending against whether we're alt-right or white supremacists, which is, I mean, sort of beneath contempt. It's just really stupid things from people who went to really smart colleges defending their guild. Because that would be my, my follow-up question, which is, um, who has changed their minds? Like, the, the sense of um, the framing, the initial frame of the intellectual dark web, I think from the interview that I did with you, was these are people who are prepared to say, you've made a better point, I've changed my mind. Who genuinely sort of changed their mind during the during the the last two years? So I think there is a widespread sense that not that much has shifted in terms of perspective. Well, let me I wonder whether that's because people are very identified with certain perspectives, like Sam Harris with the new atheist position. Um, I think ben Sam Harris better appreciates. Position. Um, I think Brett's metaphoric truth uh, position to Sam has probably influenced Sam. I think that I better appreciate Sam's focus on spirituality within a rational context. Uh, I think people have better understood why Sam doesn't believe in free will. I think that Jordan's points went from seeming a little bit fanciful to starting to uh, really get at some things that I think I probably hadn't appreciated. Jordan had a beautiful point that moved me, which was that only archetype and mythology explain why a man would go to war that it's very hard from an evolutionary perspective to imagine the individual's thought process and that it is, in fact, you know, dreams of glory and, and, and the songs we sing and, and that those sorts of things that propel us uh, into a very high probability of self-destruction. I think that, um, you know, I was able to tell Jordan that his lobster point isn't exactly correct because you'd have to chase trace the uh, serotonin mediated hierarchy of lobsters throughout the phylogenetic uh, tree of evolution. And in fact, you don't need that to make your point about hierarchies being natural, but the, the fossil record doesn't support it. I, I, I don't think that that's a, a fair read. I think that there's been a fair amount of movement and change. When I said to Ben Shapiro, what happens if the median individual in a society can no longer be reached by the market? And he said, well, then we'd have to consider something like socialism. Right? Like, I don't think people even hear that. Or, you know, when Ben and I talk about abortion, we move closer and closer to each other's positions because we're climbing down from the positions we've inherited from the legacy structure. So, no, that's not true. I mean, I think there's been a lot of movement. I think what there hasn't been is there hasn't been just an opportunity to gather, to talk uh, enough as friends because the key thing that the IDW threatens is the paid commentariat of the legacy media structure. And we talked before about how in initially, at least with the framing of the intellectual dark web, the, the people who were in the, the article, there was a lot of, because the, the actual um, shows or the, the audiences were concentrated around uh, Rogan, Sam Harris, the Rubin Report, and particularly the Rubin Report because um, He's based in LA, that he, a lot of the initial meetings happened there. And my sense... Dave was very forward in a lot of ways. Yeah. But he recognized, I mean, he was one of the first people to recognize the value of the movement. He kind of got behind it. He, he produced a few pieces saying, um, announcing the intellectual dark web. I first associated it with the Rubin Report. But um, I had an interview with Dave 
probably about a year ago now where I actually, and in the run up to that interview, I started kind of um, looking a little bit more carefully about what he was doing. And I, I had some serious, I thought if I have this interview with Dave, there are certain questions I have to ask him. Um, I was very concerned about the way that he frames his guests. I was very concerned about whether he was actually being truthful in, in terms of the, 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 the way that he was interviewing them. And I can understand, I, I may not necessarily agree with um, the, the Sam Cedar perspective that Dave Rubin is dangerous, but I do actually think that there are things that he's doing that are, yeah, that, that can be quite dangerous because I also see him on Twitter, for example, framing everyone who disagrees with him as bad faith. And I think that dynamic is very, I'm not going to say the word problematic because that's a very problematic word, but, but, I, but I do think, and I've also seen like the increased criticism of him, I think have also affected the way that people see the intellectual dark web over the last couple of years. Um, do, you, do you agree with that? Do you agree that, that the criticisms have taken their toll on the way people see the intellectual dark web? Because he was so identified with it from the beginning. Well, I think he really embraced... Uh the potential for it. And I think he exemplified the potential for it. And, you know, I think that what you have to realize is, I think I made this joke about the original title of Casablanca to get back to that film was something like everybody comes to Rick's or everybody eats at Rick's. I forget what it was. And I felt like, well, at some point, everybody came through Dave's studio because he had built a TV ready studio that was truly professional. And he produced an engaging product as an engaging interviewer. And he was talking to just about everybody who was sort of uh, in that digital layer and some people who were in the legacy layer. Um, I think that what, what happened in some sense was that when the coalescing into a thing, into a, like somehow, you couldn't actually watch a transition from the intellectual dark web, the loose amorphous object, into the intellectual dark web, the TV channel, right? Or the political party or the uh, touring company or anything like that. Because of something about this era, it just doesn't work without somebody saying, I back this with, with money. So P Pangburn was willing to back it with something, but it wasn't really very deep. Um, I think that what happened was that uh, Dave needed a business model that worked. And um, in so doing, he was trying to pull from all sides. And, and eventually, and you know, this is to sort of try to steel man his perspective, I would say, the willingness of more right of center elements than left of center elements to tolerate discourse, to tolerate people who did not exactly line up with their perspectives, the willingness of a, let's say a Dennis Prager or a Ben Shapiro to be tolerant of a gay man when they might have strong heteronormative views um, was so out of whack with what everybody expected and what the left exhibited, which was this crazy level of intolerance where if you talked to somebody who talked to somebody who talked to Richard Spencer, uh, the feeling was is that, well, you were clearly alt right. And, you know, those sort of uh, chains of association um, never made sense because they were applied completely inconsistently. The fact that Noam Chomsky talked to Stefan Molyneux did not mean Noam Chomsky was tarred, but somebody else talked to Stefan Molyneux, like Douglas Murray, that person was tarred. So, you know, there was this very confusing set of rules as to who could talk to whom about what, under which circumstances, and gain what epithet. And I think Dave just got sick of that and eventually said, look, let's, let's face facts. The right is more tolerant than the left. In so doing, uh, I think he's moved farther to the right. So I think he's become a different object. Now, does the intellectual dark web tolerate movement? I do. Dave Rubin, I consider a friend of mine. And I don't, also don't think it's any secret that he and I have come to understand each other less and less well. We've been trying to have a conversation repeatedly that never seems to close, never seems to land. So I don't actually understand exactly what's going on with Dave, nor does Dave understand what's going on with me. Now, 
If the question is, why won't you throw Dave Rubin under a bus because you don't understand or agree with him? It's because, first of all, let me be clear. I'm not in the habit of throwing my friends under a bus for anybody else's entertainment. Do I think that some of the choices he's made are not the choices that I would make? Absolutely. And I don't think it's any secret that he feels exactly the same way about me. Am I worried about some of the things that may happen on his show? Yeah, the way I'm worried about some of the things that happen on Ben Shapiro's show. However, when Ben Shapiro and I have a disagreement and I call up Ben, we're able to have a meeting of minds with fair regularity. I guess if you ask me, I think that the way in which Dave got hounded was anomalous and that that created its own feedback loop, where in effect, Dave saw a world in which people were not being fair to him. And he responded accordingly, saying, this, is, this shows the true colors of my critics, is that they're not interested in being charitable. And the people who welcomed Dave were probably from farther reaches of the right. And they said, you can bring your weed smoking, your gay marriage. You can bring all of the things that you value. Uh, and we won't crit criticize and judge you. And so I think he made his decision from that perspective, is that he looked at the intolerance of the left, and he looked at the open arms uh, coming from people farther to the right. And he said, you know what, this is a better world. And I'm tired of pretending that, uh, in fact, I have a better deal from the center, which pretends to be tolerant, but is anything but. And at, at that level, I think Dave is really reacting to saying, I refuse to have Stockholm syndrome. Now, who's responsible for that? Is that Dave's fault? Is that the fault of the people who hounded him? Is that the fault of the people who actually embraced the fact that even if they didn't believe in homosexual marriage, that they wanted to be tolerant of a fellow soul? I don't know. But the problem that I have is that I, did, I didn't and do not understand exactly the transition that has occurred. And that's why, in part, I'm not super keen to comment. I don't agree with it. I don't love it. But I don't also understand it. And I would be pissed off if Dave wanted to comment on me whenever he does comment, uh, saying that, you know, he's farther in front and don't worry that he'll bring me along. I always resent it. So is there some dissatisfaction? Sure. But there's also a greater bond of friendship. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to continue to bet on a friend who's tried to be good to me and who I've tried to be good to him in return, rather than necessarily uh, this false sense uh, and showy performative sense of uh, pretending that I'm so pure that I can't tolerate these actions from a friend. I just don't understand exactly what's going on in the system. So for me, there's a bad version of the criticisms that are leveled at Dave Rubin, which is you platform certain people and Dave's defense is I'll talk to whoever I want to. And I think that's absolutely right. There's a more sophisticated version of that criticism, I think, is is true and you actually have to kind of look closely at how this happens is how are you platforming someone or how are you what is the interaction like for me the ethical perspective as as a someone who comes from the mainstream media it's like you are the position is you are standing in for the viewer or you you are standing in for someone else who could be there asking the the questions so you have a responsibility to ask the questions that you genuinely feel should be asked of that person who anyone anyone sort of a member of the public would want to ask or feel should be asked and that's an ethical decision as well especially if you're dealing with someone who might be um, very controversial and, and Ruben has a lot of very controversial people on like Tommy, Tommy Robinson or Miley Yiannopoulos and people like that so I do think there's a more sophisticated version and I do think um, and also maybe steel, steel manning Dave Rubin's position is that he wasn't initially, he doesn't come from a journalistic background, he comes from a co comedic background and has kind of ended up in this position. But th that would be the criticism I think has got some validity, is that he has people on his show and then doesn't ask them the sort of questions that would then uh, allow the audience to make up a complete rounded picture of that person, get them to defend things they've said or whatever. Well, this is a different criticism and I think it's an interesting one. Um... I think that the key problem is that Dave has a theory, and the theory is if you give anyone enough rope, uh, they will hang themselves. And so Dave's feeling is, is that giving someone sufficient rope allows the public to make up its mind. And the key question in that, and I don't think this is uh, anything other than sort of logically following from, from, from that idea, the key question is, is there anyone skilled enough to take a large expanse of rope and never hang themselves. And I think that that would be the weakness of that strategy. For example, it's a well-known technique 
in the Middle East that you say things in Arabic that are different than the things that you say in English. And until, for example, there was a, a group that cropped up called Memri, M-E-M-R-I. And what they do is they translate Middle Eastern and, uh, languages um, and Central Asian languages potentially into English so that you can have everything in one language and you can see just how much someone's speech differs from one presentation of the self to another. And so I think that the key thing that you'd have to say about that is, do you have people who are incredibly skilled? You brought up Tommy Robinson. The, the charge has been leveled that Tommy Robinson knows exactly where the lines are when he's speaking to his own troops and when he's speaking to society at large, and that he's a very thoughtful, charismatic leader who knows the difference between the two different postures. And if you don't actually catch him speaking to his own people, you'll never really understand what motivates him. And, you know, obviously that's the problem with Dave's um, strategies. Maybe it works for all of the people who can be counted upon to hang themselves with enough rope and none of the people for whom uh, that strategy um, can be evaded through, through skill. So of the, of the initial constellation of people in the New York Times article, both yourself and Brett at that point didn't have podcasts. You didn't have your own kind of route to market in a way. You, you both do now. Mm. You say that you've both done pretty well out of that constellation and now kind of launching... You're launching out on your own? Oh, I wouldn't think about it in those terms. I would say that I want to measure. I mean, if, if the issue is listenership, yeah, listenership's been great. People are incredibly motivated. But I want to measure it in terms of actual changes in the culture. And so to the extent that we have right now people who are working on various projects that nobody's even aware of that are occurring, we have a very active group of people who are discussing these issues 24-7 using... Uh, let's say a Discord server for voice chats. I think it's been nothing short of amazing the level of dedication that a lot of people have embraced these concepts with. I mean, it was very weird, of course. The Apple Podcast showed this as being the portal as being the number one show in the world according to their charts when we didn't even have a single episode out, showing that their algorithm was, of course, uh, weirdly gameable um, because it shouldn't have recorded that a, a podcast with no shows was dominant. So that was that was very fun and amusing. Yeah, it's if you want to measure it by standard metrics of success, it's been it's been a good ride. But that's not really how we want to measure it. I think what we want to measure it by is can we take culture to a different level that is more rooted in reason, comity, uh, accommodation, tolerance, love, uh, creativity, soul, transcendence, than simply tearing each other down for fun and profit. And your podcast is called The Portal. And Brett's is called The Dark Horse. Yeah. And what are you, what are you hoping to do with The Portal? Is it related to what was what the, the mission of the intellectual dark web was? Well, it's too grand and too silly to say. But the key issue is that if you think about, do humans have a thousand years left on this planet? I would guess that we do not. Our, our power is too great and our wisdom too slight. So the key is to get people thinking, well, if we, want, if we wish to have a future, we've always inherited a future from our biology. We've now been denied a future by our power. So if you can get people trying to figure out if we live in flatland, how would we imagine an extra dimension uh, in which to escape, whether that's a dimension of thought that we've never been able to have before, a dimension of action which we've never undertaken, or to actual actually change the dimensions uh, of the prison that Einstein left it, us with, with space and time. Um, we've got to find a way out of our current predicament or we don't really have a long-term future with hydrogen devices and uh, biological agents that can be weaponized or digital attacks. I think it's the arms race between destruction and protection has been lost because of the power of the destructive objects. So we didn't know how much power there would be within the atom or within the cell or within code. We now know. And so we've been living on good luck for a while. The portal is an attempt to celebrate the most creative, most dynamic, and most agentic aspects of ourselves that look for ways out when there's none to be found. So think about Shackleton, for example. 
And what Shackleton did when all hope was lost was to make sure that he brought all of his men back alive. I think it's an incredibly inspiring tale. And whenever people have been able to find ways out of wherever they thought they were trapped, they're effectively looking for the portal. That's the purpose of the show. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.